Um, this is Byron Kim and Lisa Siegel um, speaking to everyone present here, all the Yale, uh, Yale Norfolk 2020 students, and then um, some people in Zoom land who've joined. Um, and we want to begin by thanking the Norfolk Foundation for supporting this lecture series. And um, yeah, this is the sixth and final lectures of the season. And um, what else do we have to say? Do we have any particular, all the announcements have been made. Okay, so Garrett Bradley lives and works in New Orleans. Uh, she is, and I think also in California, she has a BA from Smith College in 2007 and an MFA from UCLA in 2012. Bradley's work was recently included in Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America at the New Museum and Bodies of Knowledge at, at the New Orleans Museum of Art in 2019 and the 2019 Whitney Biennial in New York. Her recent solo or two-person presentations include projects Garrett Bradley at MoMA in New York time at Sundance Film Festival um, in 2020, American Rhapsody at Contemporary Arts Museum, Houston, Shireen Nishat and Garrett Bradley at the, Bro at the Broad in Los Angeles, and uh, Garrett Bradley's America, A Journey Through Race and Time at Brooklyn Academy of Music. Recent awards and honors include Best Director, Nonfiction Feature, Sundance Film Festival, uh, in 2020, International Documentary Association nomination, uh, Creative Capital Grantee in 2019, Field of Vision Fellowship in 2018, and uh, she was a Warhol Foundation grantee. Um, Bradley was a resident at Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in 2015, and in 2019, she was awarded the Prix de Rome by the American Academy in Rome. <clears throat> Garrett Bradley works across narrative, documentary, and experimental modes of filmmaking to address the themes such as race, class, familial relationships, social justice, and cultural histories in the US. Adopting archival material alongside newly shot footage, Bradley's film exists simultaneously in the past, present, and future, not only disrupting our perception of time, but also breaking down our preconceived ideas about object objectivity, perspective and truth telling. These narratives unfold naturally in both feature length and short film, rather than being forced into a single definition of perspective and consequently reveal the characters multifaceted individual and collected stories. On a personal note, we met Garrett when she was 14 years old. She was with her artist mother, Suzanne McClelland at Skowhegan in 1999, a school very much like Yale Norfolk located in Skowhegan, Maine. We've seen Garrett grow up from that adventurous kid. I think her mom signed her up for an outward bound type program to keep her occupied that summer. And now she's an internationally recognized visionary artist. Please give a, give a warm Norfolk welcome to Garrett Bradley. Wow. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Um... I hope I didn't just lose you. I think I you're, I can still hear audio. Um, can y'all hear me? We can hear you. Okay, good. Maybe that was just like a really professional slow fade on the on the clap, and I just I just didn't hear it. Anyway, um, hi guys, it's so good to be there. I'm actually gonna like stop sharing my screen for a second so I can see you a little bit back bigger, and be with you a little bit more. Um, uh, I also just want to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to all of you for being here. Um, I just, I know that you've been, ha hi. <laughs> um, I know that you've been having probably a really magical time and absorbing a lot, maybe in ways that you like don't even realize yet, or maybe you do realize it, I don't know. But um, I just am so, I, I appreciate you all for being so patient with me and, um, and my COVID and the world. And it's just such a pleasure to see your faces low and kind of sideways. Um, Byron and Lisa, thank you for having me here. And thank you to everyone who puts the program together. Um, I've been like, you know, thinking a lot about how to 
do this in a way that is going to be the most useful for you all. Um, and uh, can you guys hear me? Just like wave if it's like gnarly. Is it gnarly? <laughs> or or don't wave if it's cool. It's, is it okay? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, but yeah, I've just been trying to think about, you know, there's so much going on in the world right now. Like there's always a lot going on in the world, but I think we're, we've definitely reached a sort of like precipice with humanity that, it, that is actually unprecedented, you know? And I have to admit that I've been feeling kind of frustrated with my own paralysis, you know? It's, it's not a comfortable position to be in, I think, as an artist, as a maker, as somebody who, um, you know, I, I like to think that my personal values and the things that I want to see in the world are implemented and reflected in what I'm making and how I'm making those things. And, um, you know, making films in particular can really test a lot of those values in different ways. You know, I think anytime you're working in a medium where you are working with groups of people as a team, you know, um, questions around hierarchy, around transparency, around agency, all of that stuff immediately um, is front and center, you know, at least, at least for me. And so I've, I, you guys are catching me in a moment of me, like really actually trying to rethink everything <laughs> that I've, just how to make stuff in a, in a better, in a way that feels more like it can actually offer a change. Um, and I'm, and I'm actually, just feeling a bit frustrated actually, you know, to be honest with you. So, so bear with me and hopefully, you know, I also just want to say at any point, if you guys have questions, I know normally there's like the lecture and then we have questions, but please raise your hand if you have a specific question about something or you have even an idea or a thought, like I'm so eager and excited to hear what you got, what's in your head and like what you're thinking about. And um, so feel free to do that. Um, okay, so the shape of empathy which is sort of the title, I think, of the series. Um, I've also been thinking a lot about that. And I, and I love that prompt because empathy, according to the dictionary, is just your ability to feel what other people feel. And the thing I love about that is that then there is no singular shape for empathy. It's something that's constantly shifting and moving. Um, it, it doesn't have any kind of specific mold. And I think, um, a lot of a lot of where I start with stuff does begin with that exact thing with picking up on something that I can't always describe um, that usually starts just by reading something, hearing something, seeing something, and really not knowing where I'm going to go with that or how what it's going to become or do but trusting myself. And I'm also gonna have like a lot of hippy dippy shit to say because that's just who I am. But like, you know, so much of being an artist is trusting yourself and actually trusting um, trusting in the unknown. And I'm also gonna jump around quite a bit. I'm gonna give you guys like a bit of a, like somewhat of a linear situation, but then it's gonna jump around a lot, okay. Um, but I think with filmmaking in particular, one of the challenges I've had is that in traditional filmmaking, you have, a, you know, you have a story and then you write a script and then you get a, you try to get money together and then you hire people and then you make this thing. And so much of that process is about having a thesis ultimately and sticking to that thesis. In fact, part of a successful production is your ability to um, not equivocate in any kind of way <laughs> at all. Um, and I've always really struggled with that. You know, when I was in graduate school for film school, I went to learn the tools of traditional filmmaking. I was really excited about that. I was really excited to work with other filmmakers, um, but I really um, got like a bit depressed because I realized I'm actually more interested in all the possibilities that start to happen when you say, okay, well, I have this idea, but I'm actually more interested in the process than I am in the outcome, you know? And what happens in that process and how does that process open up more doors and, and other ways of thinking and seeing that I can also act on in real time in the process of making the work. Um, so what I'm gonna show you guys today is sort of like a weird trajectory, I guess, of things that have been inspiring to me um, from a very young age. Um, and 
and my kind of, I guess, like a bit of like a call and response to the things that I've been absorbing over the years and the things that I've been maybe making um, out of being inspired by that. Um, and I will diverge. So hopefully that's, that's okay. <laughs> but we're in the pandemic now, right? It's like, who like sticks with anything, I feel like. Um, all right, so let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. I wanna start, um, I wanna start with the very first movie I remember ever seeing like in my life, um, which uh, was Oliver Twist. And this film was made in 1948. The director is David Lean, who had like a really prolific career. He, he was working for like 50 years um, and he's best known for Lawrence of Arabia. Um, but I'm just gonna show you guys like the first three or four minutes of the film. Um, and then we'll, we'll keep going. Can you see that? Yeah, but it's really small. It's really tiny. Okay, I'm gonna try to make it bigger, but tell me if it's cut off. Is that okay? Uh, it, hasn't, it hasn't been made bigger yet. It, is it possible to go full screen with it? Yeah, let's yeah. see. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, so I want to show that just because uh, it's incredibly vivid. And I think it's something that just, you know, um, was burned in my mind, I think, since the moment I've seen it. And I don't remember when I saw it. I think I was, you know, I don't know, maybe eight years old or so. Um, but it's quite similar to something like um, these Dumbo, like a lot of the Disney uh, films that I was watching when I was younger. And I know this seems really to be talking about, to be talking about um, Disney films, but I actually think a lot of them were quite tragic and traumatic and and kind of instilled in us at a young age, this sense of loss. Um, and I think maybe also, you know, I clearly was was sort of like projecting a lot of my own ideas around being a single mother, right? Like looking at my mom and like seeing seeing this film, this Oliver Twist film, but then also Dumbo also loses his mom. And like all the characters actually lose their mom. I'm pretty sure there's like no moms in any of the Disney films if you think about it, right? They're all gone. And if they're there, they're like evil. So that's a problem. But um, one of the things I learned about the Disney films is that, and I'm gonna click on this one more time, is that, so this is a moment where he accidentally drinks like beer or wine or something and he gets drunk with this mouse. And it became, um, it's sort of like this, it, it was, to me, it was like a really profound moment of looking back at films, mostly when I was in college and being like, wow, in order for conservative filmmaking to have license to be experimental, there needed to be some kind of like rationale within the storyline. And I thought that was a really interesting idea and something that I still kind of grapple with, I think, around, um, oh, can you guys see what I'm sharing or no? Yeah, no, but also here at the first clip, we didn't have any sound. I'm not sure if that was oh. or not. Well, it's just like sounds of rain and storm, but we should figure it out for the next clip, maybe. Yeah, let's speak. I don't know if it's on our end or your end. Wait, can you share? There's the optimize the new option. Yeah, sure. Share it on your end. Oh. Uh, okay. Yeah, so. Let's see. Okay, optimize. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I see it. I see it. I see it. Um, it wants me to put in a password. Sorry, give me a second. Okay, I think that we should be good. I'll just test this really quickly. Can you guys see this? Um, can you see what I'm sharing or no? Okay, I'm just gonna test this for a second. Can you hear that? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, well look, anyway, that first opening clip of the film was like totally about the visuals anyway. Um, there was no dialogue. So I'm happy to, do you guys want to see it again or can we, should I just keep going? Okay. So anyway, these these two images here, um, I was just talking about, they seem significant to me just in the sense of like thinking about the stuff that we're in like pretty like basic, um okay enter the way admit oh wow okay matt is that okay i'm just like admitting people <laughs> um, you know i mean this was like anyway so these two things were like really profound for me of like what is it why did i and why did i even feel like i needed to have an excuse to to be experimental also kind of a maybe a basic sounding question but i think from my my trajectory and starting off working in mostly in a more traditional film space i always felt like i needed to have some kind of rationale and being able to see how somebody like or a company entity like disney was able to do that very very early on in the company's history had some impact on me in some kind of way um, this is an image um, from a film that was done in 1990 um, by Charles Lane called Sidewalk Stories. It's a totally silent film. I think that there's like one piece of dialogue at the very end of it, um, but it's sort of like a Charlie Chaplin-esque 
story about um, a father taking care of his daughter. And it's an incredible documentation of New York City in the 90s. Um, and at the time, I don't remember understanding why it was significant to me in any way, but I was really uh, taken with it and felt emotionally engaged with these stories. And I think that's really what I'm trying to get at with just these first four images here is just like, what were the, the, the earliest um, moments of my feeling um, like I could connect with something um, that was that was not connected to me, actually, not a, not a friend or a family member or anything in my immediate surroundings, but that was on a screen um, through images that were that were moving and and using sound and light in ways that um, existed outside of my like regular purview. Um, the other kind of clip I want to show is. Uh, also had a huge impact on me. And I think when I was in high school, I had really, I had wanted to be like a, a after seeing this, I, I was like, I know what I want to do. I want to be a war photographer. I want to like, I want to be a journalist. I want to be able to go out in the world and document things. Um, I'm going to show you, this is a, I think like a three minute clip. Uh, hopefully I can see you, but wave if you're not hearing anything. Um, James Noctway is a war photographer. He was uh, one of the, he was, he was really pivotal in bringing the war in Rwanda to the West and from a visual space, um, people understanding what was, what was going on. Um, and he's still alive and working today. Um, let's see if this. You wanna go full screen? Yeah, I do wanna go full screen. Um, let me see. Okay. Is that, is that full screen? Why photograph yeah. war? Is it possible to put an end to a form of human behavior which has existed throughout history by means of photography? The proportions of that notion seem ridiculously out of balance, yet that very idea has motivated me. For me, the strength of photography lies in its ability to evoke a sense of humanity. If war is an attempt to negate humanity, then photography can be perceived as the opposite of war. And if it's used well, it can be a powerful ingredient in the antidote to war. In a way, if an individual assumes the risk of placing himself in the middle of a war in order to communicate to the rest of the world what is happening, he's trying to negotiate for peace. Perhaps that's the reason why those in charge of perpetuating a war do not like to have photographers around. In the field, what you experience is extremely immediate. What you see is not an image on a page in a magazine 10,000 miles away with an advertisement for Rolex watches on the next page. What you see is unmitigated pain, injustice, and misery. It's occurred to me that if everyone could be there just once to see for themselves what white phosphorus does to the face of a child, or what unspeakable pain is caused by the impact of a single bullet, or how a jagged piece of shrapnel can rip someone's leg off. If everyone could be there to see for themselves the fear and the grief just one time, then they would understand that nothing is worth letting things get to the point where that happens to even one person, let alone thousands. But everyone cannot be there. And that is why photographers go there, to show them, to reach out and grab them and make them stop what they're doing and pay attention to what is going on. To create pictures powerful enough to overcome the diluting effects of the mass media and shake people out of their indifference. To protest, and by the strength of that protest, to make others protest. Does it cause them any health problems? <laughs> 
bisa bikin mata perih juga. Ya. Ada ada untuk kesehatan merusak kesehatan nggak? Oh, ada. Sisanya nggak ada, Pak. Nggak ada. Nggak ada. Nggak ada. Nggak ada. Oh, they they say um, they are cupping sometimes when they are there, but when they return, they will get something from Suhar, I believe, like uh, a milk together with uh, green porridge, and then normal again. Um, so I don't know if any, has anyone heard of, um, this guy, James Noctoy? Yeah. 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 So I, I, um, I, you know, there's so much to be said, even just from that one clip alone, you know, um, and just from the things that we're seeing in the news now, um, I think, uh, you know, it brings up the question again of just how, what what is one's relationship to um, to image making in a moment of duress? And I think even seeing this at a young age, I I have always been more interested in beauty and how um, maybe not seeing um, the violence and the trauma has been another way that's equally as powerful to counteract those things. I think for me that's like changing. As I said in the beginning, I'm 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 in a moment right now of pretty of a lot of unknowns. <laughs> you know, in my life and in my practice, but I really am starting to question how to, what that, what that balance is, you know, um, and also how that exists within, um, where is it going? Where is the work, where's the work going? Um, journalism also has its, uh, its problems, you know, just as much as the film industry does, just as much as like any kind of market does. Um, Anyway, that's a question. That's one thought I'm throwing out there in the universe um, for you guys. And so I'll show you, so with, with that in respect, so these four things, this was like kind of milling in my head around this time. Um, 2001, I made my first film, um, or actually this was a sec this is my second film. And I my stepfather gave me a camcorder for um, Christmas one year and it was, for me, like the very first time I felt like I could communicate effectively. Um, I am really very dyslexic and like it's high, uh, like being in school was pretty stressful. I was not like very good academically. I loved history and I loved school actually, but I had yet to find a way to share my curiosity and act on my curiosity in a way that I felt comfortable with and that I felt like I could do successfully. And having a camcorder allowed me to just move through the city in New York and share what I'm seeing literally with like this cheesy zoom on my camcorder. I could just zoom into that shit and people could see what I what I could see, you know? And and I could also go up to people and talk to them and have conversations. Um, and it actually was the beginning of a sort of methodology and way of making work that didn't require a lot of resources, that didn't require a team or a group of people um, that has stayed with me even until today, you know, where, which is really about a value system um, in questions and in partnership and collaboration with other people, right? I'm equally as interested, I'm more interested in what other people think actually than I am even in what I think about something. Um, and when September 11th happened, I think I had um, surprisingly, I mean, you guys are all like, for the most part, maybe too young to have known what that was like, but I know that there was, there was a lot of opportunity to have a lot of hate, you know, um, in that moment, I remember. And I never felt that, but I did feel anger actually towards tourists who then came to that site. I remember feeling really defense, like, like I needed to defend this site, <laughs> you know? And my own the way that what that I felt like I could deal with that was to go to those places and to film them, to film the tourists and to talk to them and to talk about 
how other people were feeling. So this was a film called Autumn in New York. It was made in uh, 2001. And I'll show you, it's pretty long. So I'm just gonna show you guys maybe um, three minutes of it. And again, just wave to me if you, it's, you don't uh, hear or see anything. Go. All right. This is like a really gnarly transfer. Can you guys see this? Yes. Okay. As the cloud got closer and closer, you could see the buildings two blocks away disappeared, then the, then the building a block away disappeared, and then we were just suddenly just covered with uh, with smoke. Basically, a plane crashed into the building, and this is what has happened, and now it's fallen, and as it falls, it crushes all the way down, and we kind of built a tower in our classroom, and the blocks, you know, tried to show them what had happened, but they still don't understand. As a, a third grader said, they were talking about immigrants, and a third grader asked, or the question was, what's an immigrant? The third grader says, a terrorist. I think that Latinos and Blacks and Whites are going to get a lot along a lot better now than they ever did before. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I think that people of Mid Middle Eastern descent are going to are going to be the ones that have a problem now. Maybe about a, about, a, about a good three weeks after everybody was saying hello and and consoling one another, but after that it starts to wear off. Uh, New York is starting to get back in the same way they were before. August and, and and demanding and impatient, but I, it, I don't think it was it, it didn't have to do anything racially at all no. because uh, that wasn't that, that that wasn't the aim of of the, of the terrorists. Everyone's angry, and everyone's looking for somewhere to vent that anger. And the last place it ought to be is on other Americans. Shut down the city, pick them all up, and get them the hell out of here. Um, have you guys ever been to a funeral before? Yeah, right? Oh, yeah. Do you ever take pictures of the, of the coffin when it's going to the ground? No. No, why is that? Never thought about it. <laughs> Never well, even had a camera. Well, my boyfriend's father died and took pictures. Really? Of the, of the father in the casket for memories. He video camera. Do you think? Do you think it's any different taking pictures of a coffin going into the ground and taking pictures of this site? Not really. Morbid curiosity. All we came to see was the building. I do. I understand people's desire to want to see where this horrible thing happened. Um, but I think it disturbs the people who are working on the site. Uh, they, don't, they don't feel too good about tourists and their cameras. But when you go to a funeral, for instance, oh, no, you don't, I don't take, take pictures, pictures of the coffin no. for what reason? No. Why don't you? It's just not done in the area I live in or in our family. Do you see it any different from taking pictures of this site at all? I mean, there's, I would there's, not, there's, not, a there's not a dead body laying there. I wouldn't take it of a dead body. Mm -hmm. And I don't it's, need to, to have a picture of that. So you don't see it as being similar, even though millions of people did die and people were jumping off the buildings and everything. I mean, it really is. Dead bodies are dead body. The site is a building. Well, what if there are dead people underneath the building? There are dead people underneath us right now. There's ancient civilizations all over the place. People take pictures of uh, ancient ruins in Greece and other countries. There's plenty of dead people under there. Um, so it's funny, I'm watching it and I'm so, uh, kind of embarrassed. It's well, mortifying think, um, to, oh, hold on one second. Is it still playing? Skeptical of people that's not white, because, you know, oh, you know, I'm being Indian, oh, awesome. really, you know, like you feel. Sorry guys, there's so many screens right now. Can you, I don't know what you're looking at. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to stop it there. Um, so I wanted to show that because 
even though it's like a kind of been mortifying, but uh, millions of people did not die <laughs> during September 11th on the site, but I clearly was like upset and young and like overly aggressive. Um, but I wanted to share that because I think, uh, you know, you have to start somewhere really. And um, I, I, I really wanted to hear what people had to say and what they thought. And I, and I didn't have any kind of like visual language, right? It's not like I like knew where the camera needed to be or I wasn't aiming for perfection. It was, a, it was like a one-to-one -one, like visceral, how do I connect with other people and how do I do that with this camera in some kind of way? Um, and, and I still, you know, and I should also, I'm sorry, I'm all over the place y'all, but um, I should also mention that you know, having this camcorder, I was fortunate enough to go to a Quaker school the last three years of my, um, of high school, and they had um, editing software there, this like huge, bulky machine that was like the size of a refrigerator, basically. Um, and my teacher showed us how to use it. And so I was able to edit using this thing called the DaVinci, which was a really, it's a very, it's physical editing. It was like, it wasn't film obviously, but it's very different than editing on Premiere or Final Cut or something on your laptop. Um, and I've, I have, I've only gone back to watch this stuff for the purposes of sharing it in situations like this, but it is also kind of uh, interesting to see how also you might think that you're, I mean, you might be developing a certain style, but it's also to what extent is it just connected to the machinery that you're working with? And once those things get more and more refined, what starts to happen when you actually want to create more of a challenge for yourself? And like, if I were to go back to using the Da Vinci or something, like how would that change a language or a voice in any kind of way? The beauty of it, what I'm getting at is that like, it's something that's always changing. I don't consider myself having one voice, one aesthetic, one thing that's me hopefully that's always changing and growing you know and it's also a reflection of what's available from a technological standpoint um or not available you know at the moment um so okay skipping skipping ahead to uh college um I was, so that was, a uh, this stuff was, I was making these little things in high school and I really wanted to go to film school. And my mom was um, really adamant about me not going to film school as an undergraduate, which I thank her for. Um, Cause she just was like, what are you gonna make films about if you don't know anything? <laughs> and, and I'm really glad that she did that. Um, I continued to make films when I was in college but uh, I started off in the art history department um and was looking at a lot of like dutch painting and um this is what is this called the allegory of the catholic faith yeah i mean a lot of i love this um a lot of the paintings were some especially the dutch paintings were representations of just daily life kind of in this funny way which i'll talk about later on in this there was a, there is a bit of a connection between like neo realist cinema in Italy post-World War II of like working with the resources that were available to you with non-professional actors and exterior settings with also some of these like daily life paintings that were happening in the like 1400s and 1500s as well. But I found myself really um, more interested in the religious stories. And so I transferred to the religion department and did a, a study that was a comparative study between Hindu and Judaic philosophy. Um, and that's where things like really opened up for me. Again, I feel like that was like sort of the second big moment in my understanding like visual language and where I wanted to go um, with my interests. Um, in Hinduism, there are these, so this is, a, this is a baby Ganesh, baby Krishna. And he's there, so Leela and Darshan are two terms that are actually, they're actionable terms. Leela is, is defined as, um, play right and the idea is that like every human beings are basically so stubborn that um if god tells you what to do or shows you even what to do that's right you probably won't do it so you need to be kind of like enchanted and distracted um into thinking think do it thinking you're doing something else when in fact uh just the very active engagement of this play of leela is the act of prayer um darshan is um this is another image. Um, they're sort of funny photos. Um, 
and actually it's funny when you Google Leela, this Bosch image comes up. I don't know if you guys, I hope y'all can see this, um, which is just funny. Um, but darshan is also another term and darshan is this idea of uh, sight, eyesight, the exchange of eyesight being equal to prayer. Um, and, and really the sort of uh, seeing and being seen is at the heart of Hindu philosophy. And that was something, again, for me coming from a, from a visual space was really, really intriguing. And looking at Judaic philosophy where actually sight and image making of God was sacrilegious. Um, and I was, I was, I really immersed myself in um, comparing those two different ways of thinking and continued to make small films kind of on my own. Um, this is an image, um, actually, can you guys see that? We see the thumbnail. Oh, bummer. All right, I'm just gonna go. We're seeing the thumbnail. We're seeing the Adobe Bridge window. Okay, let me, um, why don't we just do the whole desktop? Can y'all see that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is a this is from a film, Amar Akbar and Anthony, which um, is was made in seventy seven, um, and it's about three brother, brothers who are separated at birth, and one becomes a Hindu. One becomes Christian, one um, becomes Muslim. And then they all find each other at the end. And this is a mother who's gone blind and she's um, brought to a temple. And she just sort of, her, 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 her gaze goes in the direction of one of the deities. And this middle image is like Darshan, you know, uh, and she's given sight. And so there's a lot of these really cool, even in cinema, um, psychedelic, representations and articulations of these like ancient religious ideas. Um, okay, moving on, I'm sorry. If you get bored, just like wave and I'll, okay, cool. <laughs> um, and so uh, as I mentioned, I was still making films when I was in college um, and I was taking classes at Hampshire because they had, a, they actually were allowing us to play with 16 millimeter film and to edit on 16 millimeter film. And it was the first time I was introduced to like abstract filmmaking in a more formal way, like Stan Brackage films and that kind of thing. Um, and I was taking a ballet class and was really, really bad at it. Um, and a girlfriend of mine, um, you know, was like really into step back home. And she was just showing me some of what she was doing. And I was complaining about these ballet classes and, um, we feel, I just filmed her feet <laughs> and I'm going to show you guys that and hopefully, um, this I would say is the first time I maybe was trying to do some, I, well, I was actually, I don't know what the fuck I was trying to do. Honestly, I was like filming her feet. I've totally fucked up how to, how to put the film in the machine, but then this like amazing magical thing ended up happening with the light in the gate. And um, again, that goes back to just what I was saying of like, you really, you can't be too hard on yourself about trying to achieve something too specific because you wanna have these like magical things just happen, you know, and appear. Um, I wanted to show that to you guys also because uh, with sound, you know, that was a, that's a silent film. Um, and it was also, I think the first time I was able to think about sound and image separately and actually create 
like just pull I don't remember where I found that sound but um it was also sort of the beginning of like being able to take things that are, are separate match them like there's sort of this like banging that's happening and and making like a really simple connection between you know Sabrina's foot on the ground and that banging sound and again like realizing how much you can manipulate with this medium you know and I mean, I kind of, I was talking to someone the other night about, I feel like painting is the hardest thing to do. And for the, paint, for the painters that are sitting in there, you guys are amazing. I think it's so hard to do. And filmmaking is hard to do too, but you can fake so much, you know, that you really can't do with other mediums. And um, it's, it's sneaky and magical for that reason. Um, this is an image um, from, uh, Ivan's room, Ivan's child, Ivan's childhood, Tarkovsky. Um, this is them actually looking, I think it's them looking into a mirror if I'm looking at it correctly. I think just based on their, where they're, how, how it's framed. Um, but I would say Tarkovsky and Pasolini are two filmmakers that I also learned about when I was in college. Um, this is um, the gospel according to St. Matthew and I think both of those filmmakers have this, they have this incredible ability to exist in both internal and external space in a way that I, I think is really, ch it's challenging, but it's uh, it's always spoken to me as something that I'm, I'm always kind of aspiring to, because that is how we live life. And we live in between both of those spaces, you know, all the time and how in two dimensional space and in a, in a, with a picture or with motion in a film, where you're creating a new plane of reality, it's how does one get between both? It's it's not something I think is mathematical like you could describe, but both of the both of these these filmmakers really were able to do that uh, for me. This is another image from um, Saint Matthew. Um, and you all may have heard of Julie Dash and Daughters of the Dust, which I think a lot of people talk about, which is an incredible film. My favorite film of Julie's is Diary of an African Nun, which is kind of lesser known. It's a short film um, and really beautiful. So it's on, uh, it's not on YouTube. I actually wanted to do like a recording for you guys. I think it's on Criterion, but I would really recommend checking it out. And it's, and if you watch actually, uh, St. Matthew and, and the African nun together. It's a, a really great pairing. Um, but I just think that the visual language in this film was incredible and it's, it's really poetic and the story itself, I mean, dealing with somebody, an inherently religious character is kind of, is kind of doing that same internal external thing within the storyline. That's not purely visual. Um, and that's another kind of conversation that I'm sure you guys are also thinking through as well is like what is one what is our relationship to narrative what is our relationship to story versus ideas how are those things kind of articulated from with it within a visual realm and where do we really start with it where is our anchor point where are our priorities um where where do those things exist in the hierarchy of the things that we're making and um maybe that changes with every project and with every idea that you have um but I know for myself I had uh preconceived notions about what those things were supposed to be so I still do sometimes and when I find myself struggling when I'm making something I I have to ask myself those questions and it and usually it helps me kind of unravel into where I where, where I need to be because I'm like oh it's because I'm I think it's supposed to I'm supposed to have some clear story or I don't want to have a story or uh, the pictures are supposed to tell the story. The sound is supposed to do it. All Those are all like uh, things you can check off for yourself sometimes as well. Um, I think uh, if you're stuck and you're trying to make a movie <laughs> or take a picture. Um, this is just a still image uh, from Nashville. It's super tiny. Uh, Robert Altman, who uh, was also somebody I came across when I was in college who had a really significant impact on me. And, and one of the things I love about his films is he, so he puts mics on, this is just a super, this is a wide shot on a long lens, um, on like a zoom lens. 
um, I don't know, maybe they're like a hundred feet away from us. And you probably have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay, over 30 people maybe in this image. And I'd say about half of them probably have mics on them, um, on little tiny mics. And so then when you're, and then you cut to something else and he's doing the same thing with another group of 10 people, right? So then you watch the film and you're like, wow, how is it that the camera isn't necessarily moving fast? I'm not necessarily seeing a million images, but I'm somehow absorbing the simultaneity of reality in this way that feels very unusual and very true to, to life. And he does that with sound. Um, I think in a, in a, in, in a really amazing way. Um, and I, I've yet to, I mean, I haven't seen a lot of films that work that, that function in the same way that his work um, does. Gina, Gina Rowland um, uh, was sort of like at the center of a lot of John Cassavetti's films. And um, I mean, his films are really extreme. I don't know if you guys have seen any of them. They're like really macho and like kind of intense, but I liked them because he was, he was blending like a lot of control with a total lack of control, you know, together. He would let actors, they would improv over and over and over again. Um, but the cameras, they usually they knew exactly where their where their marks were going to be, and the cameras actually were were very very controlled. And so when you're watching his films, it's it's also a really interesting study on um, allowing one thing to go completely off the rails and be totally wild and to not have boundaries when it's combined with something that is um, uh, formally really um, restrictive. Um, and he's done that in with, I mean, I think almost all of his films. This is opening night, um, which is I think one of my favorite films of his. And Gina is um is really amazing to watch. Very I don't know if she's liberated, actually. That's a good question. I'd be curious to know what you guys think. Is she's if she's really liberated or if it's like something else? Um this is Maggie Chung in uh in the mood for love. Uh, Wong Kar Wai, um, his films uh, are so beautiful. And I think in that way, really similar to uh, Pasolini and Tarkovsky, but he's, you know, he, he's, it's very rich in color and he's working with um, step frames and a lot of different, um, uh, he plays a lot with the shutter and does a lot of kind of like magic tricks with the camera. Um, that are really beautiful. I'm forgetting the camera operator's name that he works with, but he was a, a British guy. Um, what is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's like wild. I think he's like notoriously a wild guy. Um, it's another great image. Um, so once I uh, got to graduate school, I, I graduated from college and went straight to graduate school and I probably shouldn't have done that, um, but I did. Um, <laughs> just because I think I didn't really have much, uh, I had no idea what the fuck I was doing and I kind of like wasted, I feel like, um, uh, I was there with people who had, I think really had time to think about how they wanted to, experiment you know and even though I I I was there to I was I didn't need to know exactly what I was going to do but I think I wanted to have a little bit more if I could have redone it I would have had a bit more thought put into what specifically were the things that I wanted to experiment with and play around with and instead I kind of tried to fit into a methodology that I was learning about that I was really eager to learn about, which was like how to make traditional films, you know? Even if I wasn't interested in making traditional films, I wanted to understand how they were made and I wanted to also work with other people in making them. Um, had, most of your, had most of your classmates, had most of your classmates taken time off? Yeah, they did. Um, most of my classmates were in like their thirties, you know, and had totally like lived lives and had jobs and and didn't done things that um, I had not 
done. There was one guy who had like just gotten back. He'd been in the military for a really long time, you know, and um, one person who had like been on a track to be a doctor and, um, you know, and I think, yeah, I think that was, that was, we were all kind of in the same boat though, I have to say. I mean, I, I just say it because I know a lot of people think about, should I go to film school? Should I not go to film school? And I think there's a more complicated, it's not just a yes or no, you know, I think um, I didn't have uh, like, t like gobbles of money to just buy a bunch of cameras and hire people to like experiment with me, you know, and that there's something really valuable about being able to go to film school and have those things, those resources available to you and to make mistakes. So ultimately it, it was a really good experience, but I do wish that I had been a little bit more, um, I think I would have been a bit more confident if I had been a bit more intentional with why I was there, you know? Um, when I was there, I also, I, it was the very first time that then I, um, and actually Byron, you were the one that told me about Killer of Sheep, I think when I was at UCLA. Um, and Billy Woodbury, who um, was a part of, um, I mean, what they call the LA Rebellion, movement. I, I think it was more like just neo American neo realism within a black Californian context um, is really what it was. I I became aware of filmmakers like Billy, like Julie Dash, um, like Charles Brunette. This is the still from Killer of Sheep. Um, and this was, I'd say like the third kind of really big marker for me really in seeing that film and in seeing a lot of films that were being made during that time because I really connected with what I mentioned earlier around what was happening in post-war Italy of, of, um, of working in exterior spaces, working with non-professional actors, um, working in an improv kind of context. Um, but it also felt really kind of romantic and very far away, you know? And there was something about seeing um, America, um, and also seeing the history of America that was being an addre addressed in a way that was not necessarily overt. And, and that is, that's something I still am thinking about. There's this guy, Jeffrey Scholar, who wrote this really amazing book, um, Shadow Specters and Shards. And he talks a lot about um, the relationship between traditional filmmaking and more abstract filmmaking. And he kind of makes the case for abstract filmmake, quote unquote, ab abstract avant-garde filmmaking being more uh, literal and accurate actually than more traditional films. And with the exception of like maybe speed, right? Or like films that are like, this shit's gonna happen in like 20 minutes, like and that's the whole movie or whatever. Like you really don't know like what the sense of time is in a film. Like when you're watching a film, time is a completely abstract thing, you know? Whereas a lot of these more abstract or experimental films, you're experiencing things sometimes in real time and you have a more um, accurate relationship to, um, to a moment. And I felt with Killer of Sheep in particular, you know, I was able to intuitively understand, you know, the impact of American slavery in our country without that necessarily being something that was stated or said, but that could be seen in the background and could be articulated in the movement. Um, and also not have that be the thing that was defining the storyline or the characters at the same time, right? How overt we need to be about X, Y, and Z, particularly as artists of color is, is another very large conversation. And I actually think that these films that were made during this time were addressing that in a way that was really important um, and really rooted in the beauty of cinema and auteurism to a certain extent, even though auteurism is like a little bit of a bullshit thing, you know? But um, so it was, it was a turning point for me actually going to film school. Had I not been there, had I not met Billy, you know, I don't know how long it would have taken me and Byron, if you hadn't told me about it, how long it would have taken me to get to get here. And it was also the first time I was like, oh, okay, I'm not fitting in perfectly, or not, not comfortably in this program, Having trying to figure out the mechanisms of like crossing the line and all the rules that you need to really follow when you're making a film. Um, I really didn't connect with it. And I, I realized that maybe I wasn't connecting with it, not because I was like dyslexic or stupid, but because I didn't care about it, you know? 
And I was actually able to see examples of other people who maybe didn't care about it either, whose value system were existing in an equal and separate space actually from understanding traditional mechanisms of filmmaking. Um, and I should say also, I think that's where, like, I, I do think for, for graduate school, for me, that that was another reason why it was, why I'm happy that I went is that I think sometimes you get to a certain point in the program and you start to feel there, and it was pervasive. A lot of people felt really like angry and like pissed off and like annoyed and like, fuck all this, like, fuck this program. Like, and it's, it's not just like the program I was in. I think a lot of people, if you ask any graduate students, like there's always that moment that starts to happen. And I actually think that's a, such a powerful, beautiful moment because it actually is not, it's not really a fault of a program. It just means that you're finding yourself. I, at least speaking for myself, I felt, oh, I was just finding myself, you know? Like I just was able to bounce off something that felt very, very concrete. And it helped me, it put me into a direction and onto a path um, that was that was needed, you know? Um, so I'll show, I think this is just a, a short excerpt. This was the first film I made in graduate school, uh, trying to make like a narrative <laughs> movie. And the assignment was, it was to make a two minute film. We had to write a script and then make a, make a film. And I just, and this was, again, this was like the beginning of the end for me of like this idea of having to come up with, with something before you make it, you know, like I, I really was having a hard time with that. Like writing the script, coming up with the story, having it feel concise having it have these three act structures. So the only thing I could think of was like this game sardines that we would play as kids, which is like a kind of terrible game because it's like hide and go seek, but just one person ends up by themselves at the end. It's like horrible actually. But um, so this is just an excerpt of that uh, and I will show it to you. Let's see, hopefully it works. You guys are seeing that, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know what, and what was that? Oh, oh we didn't say anything. Oh, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I actually realized he watching it, like that's the opposite of sardines. Like, anyway, I, it, so that's, that was what, um, that was, <laughs> that was the first film I made there. It was very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable to watch as well. Um, and so then, um, I decided to, so in California, there are these, uh, cemetery or in Los Angeles, there's these cemeteries and maybe anyone who's from California, y'all will know the, um, they're like big fields and like the cemeteries are flat. So they look like forests, forest lawn. Okay. And I don't know why, like, I just was like fascinated. I remember driving by them on the highway a lot. And, um, so I went there, um, one day and I think it was just, I just felt like I needed to like do what I what I knew in this moment. I was still was, I think maybe in my first or second year of graduate school. Um, and I started filming people, asking them if I could be with them. Um, and so that's what I did. And I'm gonna just show you guys, again, I, I this wasn't like, I didn't necessarily know why I was doing it. I think a lot of it was coming out of just feeling like, uh, yeah, quite uncomfortable in this like narrative context and hoping that maybe going back to something that I had tried uh, before graduate school would help me, would push me along in some kind of way.
，买开山鸡来了。<笑>可能每一块都挖了，有没有看到？会那么长边吗？对，这边这个怎么了？哦。嗯。长不长？哎，不会在那里吗？不会那里，不会那里，不会啊。会。我去看车，有没有石头这样出出来？这里啊。哎，真的耶！这是我。那里。对啊，这是我。那这这，我听到这个特别的。这是我们说。这是是旁边，现现现中间，中间，不行，中间不好发。他从旁边是对。从旁边对。哇，很多泥巴在里面。有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有没有？有Um, how am I with time, guys? Keep going. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so that kind of, um, those are two things, you know, so in, in graduate school, then you make like your, your thesis film. Um, and I was in the process of, I think during the summer times, like I was, uh, I'm trying to remember like which, what year this was, it. I don't remember at this point, but um, I was taking uh, Greyhound buses during my summer break between New York and New Orleans, or actually uh, Louisiana at large, like I'd go to Lafayette and then go, which is a little bit northeast of New Orleans, um, like Cajun country. And um, I was meeting a lot of people my age on those bus trips. I, I took a lot of pictures, still, still pictures. I had a tape recorder and I was um, asking them where they were going and what they wanted in life and what they felt was going to keep them from accomplishing their dreams. And, um, and maybe that's because I was asking myself that question, you know? And so, and maybe that's where a lot of sometimes ideas come from, but um, I remember at that time, so I was, I was trying to figure out how to make a thesis, my thesis film, which required writing a script and having it approved by a board and then, uh, if you were approved, then you could apply for grants to fund making your thesis. And around the same time, the New York Times Magazine had this article that was headlined, what is it about these 20 somethings? And it was like really beautiful people in mostly Brooklyn. And the, the like whole thing was that my generation was too educated to get jobs, that we were all overemployed. And it was just so offensive on every level. And it was, it was also such a contradiction to reality, you know, and to the people, myself, to the people I knew and to the people I didn't know, but was meeting specifically on these trips down to the South. Um, and so it occurred that to me was sort of this like fire in my belly that I got around like what my thesis could be, you know, and I ended up transcribing a lot of the conversations that I had with people and turned it into a script, um, 
which in my mind was kind of just like this fake thing to go through the formality of like of like moving it along because like I really wasn't interested in trying to write a script so I was just kind of like faking it to be honest with you um but really the more important part of my telling you this part of it is that um it it was it was a it was a, a moment of me understanding how my value system was going to be connected to my practice and how um how I was going to be able to in a practical way take the things that I care about and think about what justice is and in this case for me justice was um proving that there is something that exists outside of the mainstream and that actually image making it's it's our duty to a certain extent to prove that existence outside of the mainstream um i felt that in that moment maybe that isn't a pressure anyone else needs to put on themselves but in that moment for me that was that felt very important you know that like not everybody looked like janice joplin and jimi hendrix during that time period like there were other people that looked just like looked normal probably and like we're doing like you know, like regular things, you know? And so when we, when we, when we're on, when we look at popular culture right now, I think I, I always look at it as like, this is how we are going to be remembered, you know? Um, and, and are we okay with that? You know? And if we're not, what are, what are some things that we can do to add to that conversation? Um, and so I went to New Orleans and uh, I, I couldn't find any of the people that I had met during that trip. Um, Benjamin Button was being made in New Orleans at the time and Treme was being made in New Orleans at the time. There, there were all these tax credits. There was a lot of film that was happening, um, but uh, like it was for like big films. <laughs> and like, I went to a casting director and they were like, we really don't understand what you're doing or care what you're doing actually. So like, we're good, right? So I went to Craigslist and I just put a bunch of postings up uh, like casting calls and I spent about between three and four months um, at this cafe on Magazine Street uptown. And I just meet like literally hundreds of people. Um, and I whittled it down to about, I think four or five. And it really just boiled down to people who seemed really excited about it, who were reliable in the sense that like they, they had the ability to show up. Um, and, uh, and, and they were also, able and excited to bring their personal experience to these characters. And so there was one actor in the film, Elliot, but everybody else um, were really just people who were interested in being a part of the project and had never been on camera before. Um, I can show you guys the trailer if you want. I don't wanna take up like too much time. I'll just show you like, you can like Google it or something on YouTube. Um, but this is Leanne. Um, she she was an aspiring actress and model and she actually uh was gonna sign with like a big agency and then september 11th happened and um was not able to i don't know something happened and it it affected the deal that they were gonna make and um she was a single mom when i met her and had four kids and um was still pursuing acting um this is one of the bus stops. And so this became, this was my first feature length film and also my, uh, my thesis film. And um, I left Los Angeles to make the film and I stayed in New Orleans and it took me about four years really all in all to make it. Um, and, uh, you know, worked like a lot of random jobs, which I think I always say are so important to have, you know, I think, and maybe you guys don't need to hear this, but um, I think sometimes we have this idea that we're not like real artists or real filmmakers or whatever, if that's, if we're, if we have other jobs, <laughs> you know, if we're like doing other things and that, that couldn't be further than the truth. And I think actually like, you know, having other work and being engaged in the world is so essential to being an artist and being a creative person. Um, it, it, it feeds your work and it also helps you understand where your work is going and why, why it's important and what it can potentially be doing in the world, you know? And I, maybe I'm saying this because I beat myself up about it a lot. It was taking me so long to make this film. And it was like one of those things where it was like, you know, oh yeah, you're like still working on that film, you know, <laughs> like, and you're like, yeah, I'm still working on that film. And, 
working all these like random jobs. And um, anyway, that's important. Uh, it's important and it helped me actually. Um, and speaking of, of random things, Dante um, was, uh, he was a little bit younger than me and he was our mailman on Phillip street. And um, he, after I made Below Dreams, I needed something to do. And I knew I wanted to stay in New Orleans. And I was, um, you know, it's like, you need to exercise the muscle, even if you don't feel inspired, even if you don't feel like, you know what you wanna make, I think it's really important to just keep making stuff, you know? And so that's kind of what I was doing. And so I decided to just, I asked him if he would let me follow him for the day on his mail route. <laughs> and, and he did, and this is just like, I think a one, yeah, one minute excerpt of that. And so that's actually like an hour long piece, but um, for whatever reason, I have like a one minute clip of it. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was interesting too making something like that and being able to, you really can see how segregated the city is. I mean, that's something that's visceral uh, already, but um, to be able to go through his route, I remember feeling like, wow, there's a whole other, universe here an angle from which he's seeing it and level of engagement and how he's how he's interacting with people differently how people's animals interact with him differently and and what their boxes look like whether they have gates or fences or how many barriers exist in front of their houses there was just like a a whole universe of um things i had never thought about actually um that 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 brought me to um and so when I made Below Dreams, I mentioned like I I had, you know, there was I'd worked mostly with strangers, with people who I had met through like the internet. Um, and I became really close with a lot of them. Um, one of them, uh, Desmond, um one of them, his name was Desmond, and I became really close with his girlfriend, Lon. Um, and I think about uh five, five years after we made Below Dreams. Um, Desmond was arrested um, and was sitting in a private prison for over a year and a half in um, Monroe, Louisiana. And Lon became a single mother overnight. She had no experience with um, the system at all. Um, and, you know, it was like, it was just one of these things where um, I also was like going through this like crazy breakup and I had all these resources that were available to me, like all these like meditations and books and friends and, you know, whatever, like the, I felt like there was, there was all these ways in which I could heal. And for my friend, like for Lon, because of the circumstances that she was in, because incarceration was a factor, um, her resources were like slim to none. You know, there was really, it was hard to talk about with family, certainly not at work. Um, not not all friends were supportive or understanding. Um, there certainly at that point was not in any kind of mainstream way a space for there to be conversation around how one can can make decisions and move confidently forward in life with your family when you don't know what's happening with your with your loved one. Um, and so I uh, we talked about what it would mean to make a film about this. And um, I did like a Google search, um, you know, that was like, uh, 
I can't even remember what the actual search was, but the idea for me was to find other women in Lon's situation and for the film to basically be a series of conversations that could be intergenerational and that Lon, that, that could be a source of support, you know, for Lon, for the other women that were in the film, um, and then for anyone who was going to watch the film. And so I found this organization, Flick, Friends and Families of Louisiana's Incarcerated Children. And uh, Gina Womack, who's the co-founder and director of that organization, picked up the phone. And I remember it really vividly being at the grocery store and it was really loud. And I was trying to explain to her what I wanted to do. And if she had any, um, if she knew of any women that might be interested in meeting with me and Lon. Um, and she connected me with um, uh, Fox Rich, uh, who I will mention later. Um, but so these are some stills um, of Alone, and Lon spells her name Alone, um, which is why the film is called Alone, uh, even though it's pronounced Alon if you're referring to her. Um, and I, sorry, I'm missing sort of a big part of this. So this was my first like commissioned film. Um, anybody can go to the New York Times Opdocs website and submit an idea. And so it's like a pre, you know, you type in your name, your email and like a, your inquiry. And I did that and I heard back, we heard back like three months later um, and they said that they were interested and we had conversations. I put together, I wrote out some of my ideas that we had um, and they gave us, I think it was like $5,000. I, I can't remember what it was. And we um, rented cameras and I don't remember how long we shot for either, but we made this film together. Um, and then we submitted it to film festivals and then it was released through um, through the New York Times website, Opdoc's website. Um, and I think that was a turning point for me and in, in uh, working in a more in a professional space that uh, where I was getting paid uh, for the work that I was doing and that it was also, it, it was also making something knowing where it was going to go, which uh, I had never done before. And I, and was challenging actually, you know, and I'm sure some of you have been in that situation when you're, when you're tasked to make something and you know where it's going to go, it actually, it, at first I was like, I would dream for that. Like I would, I would love that, but then it also can become kind of a mind fuck, you know? Um, and uh, anyway, so that was, it was really about, um, Lon and I, it ended up, the film ended up taking a very different direction. There's a sliver of the conversations that we had filmed and it's really just between Fox and Lon at the end of the film. Um, but it, again, for me was this sort of like continuation, I think of not, not being, not saying I am a filmmaker or an artist that's interested in, in justice. I wasn't really at that point yet, but I, again, was finding myself to be motivated to make something out of what I felt was unfair, something that I didn't feel was right and something that I felt I could try to contribute towards, you know, um, in tandem with other people, like not just through my opinion, um, but in collaboration with a community. And so this is Lon, she tried on some wedding dresses um, uh, cause they were trying to plan a wedding. This is Desmond uh, in the center. Um, and Lon would go to around to the side of the, uh, the building. Um, so when they're awaiting trial, they'll have them sit in a bus that doesn't have air, any air conditioning. And um, and she would it would just be there, a way for her to be able to see him um, because even uh, you know e going even if even if Lon had gone to Monroe, um, there's so much everything is so privatized and and so capitalized on that she would still be sitting in front of a screen if she had gone up there to see him it would be like a Zoom meeting right so this was like one of the only times that she could actually be physically close to him. Um, so I, this is a sort of funny thing. Uh, I'm inclined to just talk about time really quickly because, you know, making, um, 
making alone is is what introduced me to Fox. So I'll, maybe I'll just do that briefly. Um, actually, no, I won't. No, I won't. I'm gonna I'm gonna go here. <laughs> so um, alone, America and Time are two pro are three projects that were all kind of being made at the same time, and um, I uh, okay. I'm sorry, guys. There's like a million thoughts in my head right now. And I'm just like processing them. Um, both Time and America deal with archive. Um, you know, I think around, I think, yeah, so it was like the same, around the same time, 2013, 2014, uh, Byron actually sent me an article in the New York Times about this film that MoMA had discovered, Limekin Club Field Day, uh, starring Burt Williams, who was making more money than the president during his time in like the early 1900s, um, and was a Caribbean born performer, filmmaker, um, and the MoMA thought, or they're, they're saying it's the very first feature length film with an all black cast and integrated production team. Um, and when I saw some of the clips, cause they had a few online, I was actually really struck by not just the fact of like this being an integrated production in 1913, but also how progressive it was cinematically and how generous Burt was as a performer, because despite having to wear blackface, which was required at that time, the, you can tell there is a really distinct um, and nuanced level of power and autonomy that I've never seen from a film made during that, that time period, um, where Bert was clearly not only the producer and the director, but he was also uh, enabling a situation where everyone around him were like beautiful, amazing, people like experiencing joy and 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 um and having a good time and the sort of like caricatures that you might see you really understood them as being like the town alcoholic or something right but not as a representation of an entire race um so there was a there was a lot there that i was seeing that i was really um intrigued by and 1913 which is when the film was made um was only a few years after plessy versus ferguson so this is like the beginning of Jim Crow, Plessy versus Ferguson. So the fact that you had, and it was also, I think eight, uh, 1896, 1986, 1896 was the same year as um, the modern day projector being invented. So it was like people for the first time were also able to watch films together in a room during this time period, as opposed to these sort of like individual, like the way we watch them now, you know, um, again. Uh, so you had people coming, technology was bringing people together. Um, Socially, we were becoming more separate. And then you had this like film that was made uh, in a sort of integrated effort that was really significant. And so I started this project, America, trying to think about what it would mean to evoke the spirit of, of that collaboration um, and what it would mean to also think about other histories that I didn't know about that were lesser known that could be visualized. And so the project in my mind is really, it's a visual chronology that covers 12 years starting in 1915 and goes through 1926. And each one of these vignettes represents an individual or moment in time that's lesser known. Um, and in some instances, they're not like explicitly black. In some instances, they're quite the opposite. Like 1916, the Boy Scouts of America, Woodrow Wilson established the Boy Scouts of America. In my mind, I see, I have a very specific like wonder bread kind of image in my mind, right? And so there were these like also really exciting opportunities then to like work with my students and work with my community and infuse our, our, ourselves into a history and create new iconography and new images. And, and for me, and actually like, it wasn't even just with America, I think with anything, I'm always, I love the idea that you could freeze the film at any moment and it could be like a billboard, you know, or like a um, cereal box, you know? Um, and I really I really wanted that for America. Um, and we also were able then, and I wanted to start in 1915 because that's when Birth of a Nation came out. And Birth of a Nation, as you guys know, was like, you know, sort of brought up the KKK again. Um, but it also was, I think the reason from what I was able to get, one of the reasons why Limekin, with Burt Williams was never finished was because 
Birth of a Nation came out and the producers pulled out and thought it was like too progressive, that the, what they were doing was too progressive. And it, it so they just killed it basically. Um, and I liked the idea of being able to play with 1915 and play with the white sheet, this thing that's like mundane and harmless on one end and then a symbol of violence depending on who's holding it and how it's being assembled. Um, and because it was a chronology, it was also the first time I had actually tried to think about uh, space in a different kind of way. And actually before I go there, I'm just gonna mention, I was at Skowhegan, um, as, as was mentioned, and I'm just gonna show you guys a quick experiment. When I was thinking about, I was in the process of, um, of doing these tests to try to figure out how I wanted to articulate some of these vignettes. And so this one is for 1915. And it's kind of long. I mean, I might just like cut it off midway through, but. Um, so that was a, yeah, that was like a really simple, like, it's just like a heat blanket. Um, and I was just, I was trying to figure out basically how to get here, um, which, which happened, you know, I think this is 2020 and these are four intersecting white flags, um, that, you know, are also in, this was, this was, a uh, at MoMA. And because it was at MoMA and it, it was in the space, like on that, the bottom floor, we, I had the benefit for the first time of seeing above the work, which um, I'd never been able to do before. And part of the purpose of these four intersecting flags is that it's, it's the X and it's the crossroads as well, you know? And, um, you know, and I just, there's so much to say here and I, uh, I'm gonna try to be uh, more concise that, the other part of it for me is that it was the first time because it was a chronology, it was the first time I was actually trying to teeter into thinking about making work that existed in physical space that wasn't that didn't just exist in on a two dimensional screen. Um, and, you know, really, my initial vision was to actually think about how um, all 12 years could be something that could exist in singularity, but also be understood in relationship to one another. And so working with a semi-transparent material and coming up with a design that was 360 degrees actually allowed me then, allowed people hopefully to um, make connections between different images that are layering on top of each other that are completely unique to them based on their height, based on their curiosity, how they wanna move through the space. And that that in some ways is like also an analogy for how unfortunately history is kind of understood and perceived. Um, and so um, the other thing I'll just mention around, around this project was, you know, dealing with, with archive again, um, with something that was pre-existing material from like a hundred years ago um, and trying to channel it in a way that felt intentionally correct and that, um, how could I evoke and get out a certain truth that I knew to be true, right? Which was that like, what, what was maybe less discernible at 17 frames a second, um, how, could I, how could I infuse my intuition or what I knew 
about that moment, um, which was that there was a lot of power and autonomy. How could I find a way to take something that appeared to be fixed and make it flexible in the archive? Um, and so that also was a question around at the same time, around time, where you know I wasn't aware in this instance that Fox had an archive. I was what I thought to be a follow-up to Alone, a sort of sister film to Alone, another short film. Um, and then after filming, you know, she like generously offered me what ended up being a hundred hours of her own home archive. Um, that became a really different, a similar and different conversation around how I was going to deal again with something that appeared to be fixed, you know. Um, and this image on top, you know, I mean, or the image on the bottom is I, we spent a lot of time with Fox, with her sitting at her desk in this exact position. And it was one of these like bizarre moments of looking at the archive and seeing almost exactly the same positioning that she had put her camera like almost 20 years prior. Um, I'm kind of rushing because I just think it's, I'm being so slow, but uh, anyway, it was, it was the same kind of conversation that was happening around, I think, so there was like a trajectory that was happening with Below Dreams, meeting Desmond, meeting Lon, making this film with her, meeting Fox in the process of making Alone, um, making time in America sort of around the same time and, and having to work through what it means to, to create a dialogue between the past and the present um, in a textural, physical way. Uh, and things that I had, that I shot myself and things that I did not shoot myself. Um, and I just, you know, quickly should, I really want to mention just Isaac Julian's Looking for Langston. This is a film that I was super embarrassed. I actually did not know about. I was all the way in like the sound mixing phase of America. Um, and uh, Glenn uh, Ligon gave me a DVD um, and was like, I think you should see this film. And I was like, holy shit. Like, I just felt like, really, I felt like an asshole to be honest with you. And then I was just completely inspired and so uh, thankful to know about it and um, actually met Trevor Matheson uh, who did the, he was one of the, uh, was part of the Black Audio Film Collective in the UK, who ha they have their own incredible trajectory that was simultaneous to what Spike was doing here in the States. And there's an amazing conversation around like, what is Black filmmaking? Uh, and the two different approaches that that their collective and sort of Amer Black American cinema was also making around that same time period. Um, but Trevor, you know, I wanted to sort of pay homage to, to this film and to Isaac and to Trevor's work. And so we used um, a little bit of the sound in America as well. Um, so anyone who's not seen this, I highly recommend it. Um, this is Fox, the family. I think I can just, you know, I was gonna show you guys this other film, but I think I should just kind of open it up to, this is Angola, sorry, I'm just gonna mention here too. I am gonna mention really quickly the, um, so Angola, for those of you who don't know, um, is the state penitentiary in Louisiana. Um, and it's about 18,000 acres of land. And it was several different plantations um, that were consolidated into a single plantation. Um, and it's nicknamed Angola after the enslaved people that were brought from that country to these plantations. Um, and our drone, you know, there's a lot of, uh, it's very difficult to document prisons. Um, and they kept shutting down all the radar. They're able to shut down the all your drones. So we had to go across state lines to the other side of the river. And we were only able to get a fraction of the prison. And so I, I, um, I'm mentioning it just because this image to me is so frustrating because it's it doesn't even speak to the magnitude of what Angola is. Um, and it only, you know, further emphasizes the conversation of, of what the role of image making is specifically around incarceration and in our country and that families, um, in many cases are the only evidence of, you know, over 2 million people that are incarcerated in our country right now. Um, so I don't know. I just, I had to mention that cause I put it in here and I couldn't not say anything. Um, 
so guys, this is like probably the messiest lecture that you've ever heard. And I hope it's been awesome. Um, if you want to, you know, I'm happy to, um, can I just get a raise of hands? Who wants to just like start talking and who wants to like see um, a nine minute film? Let's just start talking. Let's just start talking. I mean, I'm happy. I think it would be great to start talking, but I don't I would to say it. I'm wrong. I, we can start. Let's just start talking. Yeah. yeah. I, wanted to ask, I wanted to ask you a question that I kind of hesitate to ask because it's such a huge question, but you've already partially answered it, which is how much making community in New Orleans you know, how, how crucial it was to your process? I mean, it's kind of a leading question and you already started it, but can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, it was, I mean, it was really important and I didn't go into, I didn't move to New Orleans thinking I want to make films here, you know? Um, I moved there to make my thesis film and then I remained in you know, it, I, I really developed like close familial relationships with the people that I happen to be making these films with. And, and then through that just natural connection that was separate from a craft, separate from a career, separate from making anything, um, you hopefully as a friend, you're paying attention to what's going on in your friends' lives, you know, and to the things that matter to them. And then you start to ask yourself like, well, how is this just this one person's experience or is this pervasive? And if it's pervasive, then there's something that we can do about it, you know? And so I think that the connect, the community part of it is, um, it, to me, it's important to make a distinction between community, um, I guess around, uh, well, what am I really trying to say is that yeah, community is really essential. <laughs> it's really important. <laughs> and and you can make films without community, you know? It's totally possible to do that. Um, and you can make good films without community. Um, but I think I think for me, I, um, I really care about what people are thinking and what they're going through. And I wanna make things that are in response to that because um, I think that we, you know, we're all in the same boat actually, even if we don't, think that, you know, or, or feel that. So Gary, you, you began um, to talk by speaking about your anxiety of staying on script or staying directly on the narrative to start off with in a film. And I'm wondering where, where exactly you are in that process. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> well, um, um, <clears throat> I am, working with a writer for the first time, which maybe is a great way to just avoid it altogether. <laughs> no, um, I mean, I still think it's, it's, it's a fundamental difference between making movies that again, like really root themselves in storytelling, you know? And I mean, stories are so important. Stories are, are what build societies, you know? That's what America is. It's a story, you know, it's a myth that some people believe and some people don't. I mean, there's like also, there's also reality, you know, which is like, hopefully that's going to overcome the mythology here in the country sooner rather than later. But so stories are really important and I really see value in them. But I think for me, I just, and that's why I wanted to show the, the Forest Lawn Cemetery film alongside that, the black and white one that was like clearly scripted. Um, I think I just am drawn to I want to try to find a way to do what stories do um, without having to write them necessarily, you know, to be able to show how surreal and beautiful and visceral real life is, you know, which is also what stories are trying to do, you know. Um, I, I am working, as I said, I'm, I'm working with a writer um, right now as for an adaptation for Parable of the Sower, for, uh, for Octavia's uh, Parable of the Sower. And um, that is, it's it's this weird universal thing where it's like the universe is like, cool, Garrett, like you thought you like maybe 
figured out how to avoid or articulate your problems with storytelling, but now we're going to like give you something that is actually about this present moment, <laughs> but that's like in a book, you know? So I think I'm figuring that out. Like, how do you work with text that that is also pre-existing, that is very much within the context of a narrative, but that is essentially a documentary at this point, you know? Um, I don't know, that's, a, that's, a, that's where I'm at right now, you know, trying to figure that out. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, um, how do you choose excerpt from like a longer work? Like let's say you have to choose like a one minute excerpt of like your a 30 minute video piece or like one hour piece, like how, how do you choose certain excerpt instead of the other one? Mm -hmm. And the second uh, question I have is, why do you choose black and white instead of color for certain things? And mm. Mm. So the first question was uh was like how to well, how to do why why how 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 I help like formulate like an excerpt from a larger thing. Yeah. 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 So I think it depends on um I think there's mm. two for me, there's two different ways of doing it. One is to just completely forget about the longer part of it and just say to myself, okay, I want to make it a minute. Um how do I make this something I love in a minute, you know? And I don't try to tie it to what it already is. I don't try to tie it to its pre-existing identity of like, well, this is how it's articulated in this longer thing. And I just need to make a shorter version of that. It can be a completely different beast, you know? It's like olive oil can be used in a lot of different ways, you know? Um, so I think that's, that's, one way of doing it. If you are working with something that does ask for a bit more structure, you know, then it's kind of like just what are the most essential, and it's fun actually thinking about it that way. What are the most essential elements of this longer work? You know, um, if I, and, and I always say like, a, if you had to tell this story in a, in a still image, what would those still images be? You know, and that can also sometimes help you get down to the bare bones of what something longer is, you know? Um, and then the color, the color and black and white thing. I mean, you know, I always say like color is like, it's, it's, it's an option, you know? I mean, it used to be like, we used to only have black and white and then color became a thing. And then it was like, oh my God, like black and white is so like early 1900s or whatever. Like we have to go in color, like, because, you know, but I, it's still an option, you know, like, I think that the medium is just too young for standards, you know, and if black and white stock exists and color stock exists, then there doesn't actually have to be a deep reason for why, you know, um, with America, you know, America, I know, as I mentioned, I was making a loan in America around the same time. And I chose to shoot on, I mean, I was shooting on film and I wanted to have certain sort of like formal parameters and restrictions in making that work that I thought would help connect the process a little bit more with also, again, thinking about the spirit of what it meant to make a film in the night in 1913, silent, right? No dialogue. How do you articulate narrative and story through, through physicality, through performance? Um, what does it mean to not be able to shoot endlessly on, on digital? What is it, you know, to have to work with a film camera? Um, and in the 1900s, they didn't have, yeah, they didn't have color. So I knew it had to be in black and white. And there's something that's funny that happens once you start shooting in black and white, it's really hard to see in color. Like it's, I had a really, really hard time. Like I, I just saw alone in color because I was making America. And I mean, so I saw alone in black and white because I was making America at that same time, you know? Um, so, and in that early, early film from like 2001, I have no idea why it's in black and white. I probably just liked the camera was able to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have uh, maybe two questions. One, I can't remember the name of the the reference, the clip that you played about the uh, war photographer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah James yeah. Natway. 
<laughs> yeah, and it's spelled like N A C H T W E Y. Um, there was something in there was something in um, how he describes um, the work that he does, and I know you know uh, an attempt to produce images and create images of the tragedy of war. Um, because these images don't want, the, the states don't want the images to be reproduced because they don't want folks to know what they that is actually going on. And um, I, I thought about that and thinking about um, this text that's produced by Ernest Friedrich, which also um, is called War Against War, which also has this kind of threat in it. It's a documentation of the tragedy that was the work of things before. Um, after World War One, um, and then there is, you know, the way that he describes what he's doing. And sorry, this is kind of a, a longer question. Uh, the way that he describes what he is doing um, in bringing out these images is that it's a kind of anti-war gesture mm -hmm. to, to show the image of the, the, the birth and face of the world. It's a kind of anti-war gesture. Um, and that for me speaks about a kind of moral persuasion. You know, to show these images is to you know show the worthiness of any kind of thinking person with the heart will identify with um, those who are being obliterated and say this is horrible, we need to stop it, etc. But as you know, we all know um, the images of war can be used in that way. And those same images are also used to get folks into it. And so I'm really critical about, you know, just that kind of greed of, of that as a, as a particular position. And I kind of see that in, um, in the time piece, I haven't seen the alone piece, but in the time piece that we, we were able to watch it. Because there's a lot that, if that piece does do, one of the main things that I feel that it does is it has a kind of moral persuasion in presenting the story of this woman who um, is trying to get her husband uh, out of prison. And I, I feel like it's moral persuasion because it presents part of the story and it presents it in a way that um, it appears that we as, as the audience are to kind of empathize with her position or with her plight. Um, but it doesn't. It gives. A, it doesn't give um, time or a kind of chorus of empathy for the grandmother, the, this woman's mother. For the what? Um, for the mother of that woman. Uh. Doesn't give a position for the mother. There's one scene in the film where you know after this guy gets out of prison, there's a big celebration, and the grandmother has this intense scowl on her face. Where everyone's celebrating and she is not because she has had to, you know, fill in the gap for all of this. And I'm just curious about that because that particular representation flows so seamlessly into so many um, contemporary images and a contemporary conversation about um, police violence and kind of binding of black black people and the police. But it participates in that conversation conversation in a in a way which isn't in my read of it, it isn't critical of that. It participates in it in a particular way because there's no, um, because of the way the story is presented, how it's set up for who, who, for who we should empathize with. Mm -hmm. We should empathize with. And for me, there's a kind of like um, absolution of some of the acts that created that situation. And because we are to give empathy there, there's a kind of like reproduction of a kind of, you know, what some folks call a bigotry of no expectations for this black family. And in, in a general way, just like um, in the black community, when these types of things happen, you know, there isn't this kind of critical conversation. It's more of a one sided conversation, as I said in the film. And I'm curious if you could begin to speak to that once to the, um, the choice of the uh, not to not this quote, this film quote that you used in the beginning, but also what you were trying to do um, in this film, time. Um, okay, so 
can you say that last part again about the the quote the you said the last the last thing i'm sorry i just was like um in the quote the, um there's this video that you, you put up and you said that earlier you wanted to be a war photographer um mm -hmm. the that was best friend and the person you quoted i, I can't pronounce his name not to yeah 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 um, made these kinds of statements which were the production of images of war to show the the horrific of the, the horrors of war as an act of moral suasion to sway people away from war. Right. right. Yeah, I got you. Um, well, that's an interesting that's an interesting connection actually that I wasn't fully thinking about actually, but I'm gonna think some more about. Um, I mean, with in time, it was important uh, for me to find a way to articulate that incarceration is an intergenerational problem, that it doesn't just affect one person. And Miss Peggy, Fox's mother, had one way of dealing with the same problem that her daughter was dealing with. And her sons, the, the third generation, had another way of dealing with it, right? Um, the, the advice that she gave her daughter to go into the courthouse and basically give a white judge what he wanted is something that Fox decided not to do. And that was very much a reflection of her mother's generation's form of survival. And it was it was uh, Fox's own actions were a reflection of her generation's form of survival. And her sons, you know, Freedom in particular, you know, who's going into politics is also responding into it into his own way. Um, and so I guess on one hand, of course, it is about empathy and about and uh, and about how one you know one thing can be flipped on two different sides to be used for two different purposes but i think it's really in this instance the way i was looking at it was more about um of course it's about empathy but it was really more about how do we how are our the ways in which we respond to something a reflection of our generation and, and where we're at historically um Yeah. Can, can I do a follow up question? Please, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, just, just to be clear, the, the way in which like two couples, a couple who both were incarcerated, so, well, I don't remember their names, but one of them got out first, the man was in, or mm -hmm. are, you, are you speaking about the way that they responded to their situation, which was the crime they committed, is related to their generation? And are we to empathize with that? Is that? Oh, uh, I mean, well, I don't think anyone has to empathize with anything. I mean, I think that, I think that I definitely had empathy. Yeah, they they robbed a bank, but the film isn't about if we should have empathy for them because they uh, committed a crime. The film is about what happens after a crime is made, and is is. A, a, a numerical life sentence fair and how are we weighing and understanding what's fair and how are we seeing the effects of the of that judicial system and what's happening to their father being gone to a family and how is it that the family can resist those same systemic problems and then how is it that that there's negotiation within the family on how on what resistance is going to look like I just have like one more. Can you like just um you to how, for example, later you spoke about you know thinking about popular culture and what it is now and how things will be remembered in the future, and there should be a participation in that if you want to change, etc. And I'm curious because of your response, how like how films which um document um, an, an event like the film that you documented. Mm -hmm. uh, like the thing that you documented in the film, um, Time, a film that document that experience, um, like how they, what, what kind of like image, future image of a kind of black family or even just the absence of, you know, just all of the kind of trauma that's present there, how does that, film contribute to a future image 
you know, because this image can be used in so many other ways, in so many other ways. And there's, as you know, there's so many other instances, folks who are of that generation, the folks who um, committed the crime, who didn't make that choice. You know, there's so many other other choices. And so a part of it is like, I'm curious about, like, okay, I know why you I mean, said you chose it, but I'm curious about like, how you feel this image in the future contributes to a kind of collective body of black image of black images, you know, what does that then tell people in the future to begin to do or to to to, act, to engage with people um, who look like the folks in the future? Well, what did you see? I mean, okay, so, I mean, because you're not responding to the question, then I'll give a positive, um, a positive read of the film, um, of my position of the film. One of the things that I, I see, in, that I see happening in that film and in the reception to it, and even in the reception of the film here amongst, uh, amongst the cohort, um, is that it, it participates so seemingly in a contemporary conversation um, which surrounds um, blackness or black people. And it participates in an unfortunate way because it causes us to empathize with the, the couple and with, with the, the family. To empathize with the couple and with the family. Wow. Um, but it's an uncritical um, empathizing. Do you feel couple. like we need to be more critical of, of um, black families in America? <laughs> I mean, like I didn't finish my, my initial point, but I feel like it participates in an uncritical way, um, which causes us to empathize with this family. And because it causes us to empathize with the family, it reproduces a kind of bigotry of low expectations, which is because they do this, in spite of that, we should still like empathize with them. We should still say, oh, this is okay, et cetera, et cetera. That feels to be the position. Yeah. And that's so contemporary conversation around black folks in this country, which is very important. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. I that's the first time I've heard that. I think um I mean to, I'm curious I was genuinely curious what you saw because what I see is like incredible resilience. I see this like this like family matriarch. Ooh, did it freeze? Can you guys see me? Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know where I got cut off, but I was just gonna say, I, I was really eager. I'm curious to know what you saw because, ooh, it's still skipping. Fuck. Is that better? Yeah, we're fine, we can hear you. It's good on our end. Oh, it's good? Okay, good. It's good on our end. Um, uh, because yeah, I mean, I see this like incredible family matriarch who is like resisting being defined by the system, um, and finds a way to also have her kids do that, and also is keeping her family together over the course of like twenty two years, um, in a pretty, I think, remarkable way. If if there's any danger, in my opinion, and this is the beauty of um of the future hopefully is that we can be black and also have different opinions about things, right? Um, especially in art. Um, but part of the beauty of it is that like, uh, yeah, they were able to to stay connected for, for such a long time. And I think, I think when you, I think the system, when you're touched by the system, I don't think people realize how um, effective it can be in um, shaming people, taking uh, taking their individuality from them, from from for, from who they are, and um, it it tears families apart, you know. And that's just like a that's been from the beginning of time in our country, you know. Um, it sounds to me like maybe there's like a focus on the fact that they committed a crime, and it feels. Like maybe what you're responding to is like, uh, but why are we celebrating people who committed a crime? Um, and I guess I just was less interested in the crime and I was more interested in like, well, ha what happens after the crime? 
And how does a family stay together and stay resilient after you make a mistake? What we need more of in the world is like forgiveness, right? We make mistakes and we have to be able to forgive ourselves and to forgive others. And we don't have to uh, get down on our knees and be what the system wants us to be in order to get that. We can be strong and we can love ourselves and also get that. Oh, sorry, can you come a little closer or if, uh, yeah. Uh, mine was more of a statement in like the defense because when I watched the movie, it really had nothing to do with the crime itself. Because like we saw him hanging here, like he was in jail. It's not that he wasn't hanging in some type of way, but it was more of like we're watching this woman try to keep her life together and her family together in any way, shape, or form that's possible. And like to me, that crime that's not necessarily was bad because he was just trying to help his family. Um, now there's different ways of going about that, but I guess it would be more helpful. For everyone, but it's not really about the crime, especially in this sense, because this crime will also be committed by other people where they don't really serve that same 20 or like 20 to life year sentence, which is like absurd. So it's like, I don't think it's really about like, and you should be looking up to this man or his family. It's more of the system is broken because it's hurting family in this way. Like, if you really are trying to help someone rehabilitate rather than punish, because that's not really how, like, I feel like if you spent a week or two years here, he still wouldn't have gone back out and committed another crime like that. Um, but they chose to give him that long sentence because uh, I'm believing in my heart the color of his skin because that really would, I don't think it would have been the same way I had been white or any other, like a different race. So, or like the situation of his family being there. Um, I mean, even if the mom went in the way the grandmother told her to, I feel like it still would have been the same outcome. Um, we're still having to fight for his freedom. We'll like, stand up for him. Um, but I guess I do have a question for you. Uh, mm -hmm. How much did it mean and how much did it change the way you put the world making that movie? Getting to hear that experience from that family? Because um, that's not a thing that everybody usually gets. In their life, they would just watch from the outside and not look at that full footage and like full story from their mouths and like see them like operate. And I just want to know like what that meant to you and how much you changed your scope and like how you go forward and make some movies and like trying to change hearts and show stories. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think, um, you know, as I said, like I, I made time, I, I conceived of that in, as a sort of an extension of alone. And alone also is looking at, is sort of centering the black female experience in relationship to incarceration and in relationship to family. Um, and, you know, and also, as I mentioned, Lon had no experience with this at all, right? And I actually think there's something really interesting about about what both of you were saying and also how, you know, Lon and Fox are very, very different women. And they were brought together for the purpose initially of Lon trying to understand what to do with having no experience with the system, right? And so it's almost like a fast forward of Fox's life who by that point, you know, is like, I don't know how many years older than Lon, but much, much older and way more versed in the system at that point. Learning how to, you know, move through the system is like you all learning uh, tax code, like getting the book and figuring out how to do your own taxes with all the fancy loopholes. That's how complicated it is, you know? Um, and so there's a lot of power in their difference. And that was actually part of what motivated me was that I was like, you know, I don't want this short film with Lon to go out into the world and have people think that there's one monolithic uniform way in which women are navigating this situation. Lon is also a very quiet person. She has a very different demeanor, right, than Fox does. And so it was like, how 
can this conversation be extended and continued on while also showing the diversity of experience and the diversity of individuality and how someone is going to respond to the same situation, right? Um, to a very similar situation. Um, and so I guess it changed me one in that, um, I mean, with Fox, I think the power of family as corny as it sounds was really significant. You know, I know a lot of people who have a loved one that's incarcerated where a parent was not, you know, did not make sure that they went, you know, and during visitation twice a week. And that has a real impact on families, you know, not because they didn't want to, but because it's difficult. It can be really hard, but that's part of what the whole system does. It's not just about a person being locked up. It's about the ripple effects that that has on a child's development on you know one's intimacy with themselves and with each other and that becomes intergenerational right and so when you see somebody like fox who found a way to resist that right all the way down to the way that she looks right if you get pissed off because of the way she walks into a courtroom that's because you have some preconceived notion around what she's supposed to be doing and not doing right that's important that's important for us to be aware of you know that doesn't come out of nowhere that comes from us being systematized, you know? So there's a lot of aware, and, I, and also I just wanna say too, you know, I think, and we talked about this, like what does it mean also for these boys to have to like every year their life present themselves in front of a parole board, right? Of course that has an effect on how you're presenting yourself, you know, in a way that's not fair or just, but is real and we can't, pretend that it's not real. Um, so it affected me. It affected me um, because, because all things that we do affect us, you know? Um, and, and I, uh, and also here, you know, when we, when we would tour the film and talk about it with a lot of different people, everyone always was like, the, the focus was always on, especially with, with Lon too, well, what did Desmond do to get into prison? Why is he in prison? They wanna understand the mechanisms of the law and, and all this. And at the end of the day, there's over 2.5 million people that are incarcerated in our country. That means there's if not double, triple, quadruple the number of people that are also incarcerated serving time on the outside in this country. And getting kind of wrapped up in the minutia of certain things I think is uh, is a way for us to not feel empathy and to not try to create change, you know? So I don't know if I'm asking, if I'm answering your question, um, but I'm really glad actually that both both comments were just made because it, it's, it creates space to, to talk about this stuff, you know? Why are those emotions coming up for you, you know? What does that mean? What are you not used to seeing? I, I want to give uh, space for for other people to ask questions, but I also um, I also feel it was such a generous um, presentation, and I want to be really respectful of your energy. And I know you have to meet people after this, so yeah. um, I wonder whether we should just go on to the next thing. <laughs> It's not really a question. I just wanted to say thank you for sharing all your like, um, thank you for sharing all your concerns right now. Um, and I just want to say thank you for sharing all your concerns right now because a lot of things I related to and I feel like you're like steps ahead of me. And it was really inspiring to hear like the concerns and things like that, especially the progress of filmmaking. Because once you were involved with it, a lot of people, it's a different mm -hmm. kind of question than making or for yourself. Mm -hmm. And like I myself have a lot of questions, and I know it means a lot for someone to like be really open about it and share. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. See you later, I think. <laughs> Actually, Matt, how does this work? Do I um sign off or should I stay on?